Okay, why don't we get started? It's uh, 7.34 in the evening on Monday, October 5th, 2020. This is a regularly scheduled meeting of the Village of Austin and Historic Preservation Commission. I'm Adam Markovic's chairperson. Could each of the commission members state their name for the record? Great poll. Stephen Casey. Catherine Wilson. Dana White. Also in attendance is Corporation Counsel Stuart Kahan and the Director of Planning, Jaime Martinez. Thanks to everyone for being here. We don't have any applications before us tonight. Um, we do have two agenda items and one or two other miscellaneous matters. Uh, let's start with the first agenda item, which is the high school essay contest. I'm happy to provide an update on that. We uh, released a final version of the contest to Mirla Puelo at the Village of Ossining High School. And Ms. Puelo has distributed the essay contest to uh, the social studies teachers. We revised the deadline uh, at Corporation Council's suggestion, which I think is a wise one, uh, to November 30th as a deadline. I don't believe uh, there have been any submissions to date, but it's really only been about a week and a half, maybe two weeks at most, uh, since the contest was um, released. Uh, I will check in with Ms. Puelo uh, toward the end of the month and before the next meeting to see um, if, the, if there have been any students who've expressed interest or teachers who have questions or, or anything at all relating to the contest. Uh, I, I wouldn't anticipate that there would be submissions until closer to the deadline, uh, which again is November 30th. The submissions will, will go directly to Jamie Kane, who will forward them in turn to us. And it'll be interesting to see how many and how many will be essays or videos. Um, and we'll discuss further at, as we get closer to the deadline. Um, I, you know, I don't anticipate that it'll take us very much time but, uh, to, to review the submissions, but I, I suppose time will tell and we'll see. We'll talk more, um, depend, you know, when the time comes. Now that's an update there. Uh, the second item on the agenda is, um, is the museum in the streets. Um, and that was prompted um, in part by a suggestion circulated by former commission member Miguel Hernandez, who had proposed adding a um, an additional site to the museum in the streets um, tour that that we've got now. So let me say a few things about this. Um, and then I, I invite everyone to, to chime in. Um, I, I set about over the weekend familiarizing myself some more with the museum in the streets program. And I started by going to uh, a map that I have passed many times, walking past the open door offices on Main Street. It's a, it's a big map, uh, a placard. Uh, it's sort of the, the, the master map of the Museum in the Streets project here in Ossining. And on this map, there are 25 sites um, the descriptions for each of these sites is on a placard in front of each site. And the, the, the master map does not contain a description of the particular sites. It just enumerates them, shows, uh, shows where they are on a map, and the master map provides an overview uh, of the history of Ossining. I'll add, it's very impressive, the overview. It, it, manages to do a pretty good job in like three paragraphs from uh, Native American times to the urban renewal to the present. Um, okay, so that's the first place I started. 
Uh, and uh, then I wanted to see uh, what kind of materials were available uh, online. Um, and this was a bit more challenging. Um, you may know that the HPC has its own web page. And um, actually, Jaime, it might help if you could. Um, uh, uh, oh, I see Phil needs a link to the meeting. Um, okay, the best way to get the link to the meeting is to go to the um, HPC um, agenda can, on the uh, web. I can so forward him my, uh, my email, I'll do that, and my email invitation. All right. Well, I just forwarded Phil the, uh, the invitation that I used to get on tonight. Uh, Jaime, I wonder if you could um, share your screen and maybe take us through the Village of Ossining website. Hey, Phil, he, he made it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Would that be possible, Jaime? Yes, um, I'm just changing Phil's name so that, uh, for the record. Yeah, so if you give me a second here, um, share my screen. Okay. Uh, what would you, you want me to take you to a specific section? Yeah, if you could go to yeah the main the main page. Oh, that's great. Can everyone see that? Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so um, why don't we go to the HPC page? I, I figured out how to get there. You know how to get there, Jaime? I do, yeah. Here we are. Okay. All right, so here's our web page. And Jaime, you know, my first question is, if we want to make changes to the web page, whatever kind of changes there, there might be, how, how do we go about doing that? What's the process? Do we email you changes? Is there a webmaster we contact directly? It depends on the type of change, I guess. Um, if it's just a text change, then you can just email to Jimmy Kane if you have some um, maybe more grand vision of how you want this change that in a way that would change elements um, like pictures and various different things and it might require a higher level of assistance. All right, well, here's, um, I'll just make an observation. You'll note there are a number of tabs on the left-hand side beginning with Historic Preservation Commission agendas. There are two tabs for locally landmark properties. And one of them it leads nowhere, it's a dead link. So uh, that one looks like the good one. So that's the one that I think should be eliminated. Yeah, okay. How, how would we go about eliminating that? Uh, I'd have to talk to Jimmy Kane about that. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, I'm not sure, I've never actually uh, used this so I'm not sure what kind of content management system, but- Adam, if you have particular issues with the website, just send us an email and we can deal with it either through Jamie Kane or Jamie Hoffman. Okay. So that, that's one issue. And Jaime, if you could go to resources. All right. So uh, we have some resources and these are all uh, helpful. We've got the New York State Office of Historic Preservation, something about the tax credit program, the park service, something about paint colors, and tax credits, uh, tax credit updates. I, I would wanna review that more carefully. What I wanted to point out to the group is that um, there are some resources that are missing and um, 
specifically a link to the museum in the streets. So I, I think that really ought to be added to resources and I'll, I'll follow up with Jamie Kane about that. I'll CC uh, Jamie Kane, Jaime, um, I'll CC Stewart as well. So I think we need a link in resources to the museum in the streets. I think we also need a link in resources to the significant sites and structures guide. I think we need a link to Dana White's fantastic uh, video on the history of the downtown. Um, as well as a link to something uh, separate and apart from the museum in, in the streets, something called the downtown walking tour. So I'm going to, I'm going to send an email to, uh, to Jaime and Jamie and Stuart, and I will include in that email my suggestions for adding links and removing some tabs. But let, let's actually try to find the museum in the streets. Jaime, if you could go back to the main webpage. Go to about, right at the top. Okay, you'll see, oh, you'll see there is a, a tab that says walking downtown Ossining. Okay, so we have links uh, here uh, to the museum in the streets, as well as to something called the downtown walking tour. Jaime, could you click on the downtown walking tour link? All right, so I discovered this over the weekend. There is a walking tour of the village. And this is separate and apart from the Museum in the Streets uh, heritage tour. From what I can gather, this downtown walking tour, which includes 20 sites, as compared to the 25 sites in the Museum in the Streets, uh, was developed at or about the time that the Significant Sites and Structures Guide was developed, around 2010. From what I can gather, the Museum in the Streets was launched approximately six years later, in, 20, in or about 2016. Um, I suppose it's okay that we have these two separate programs that are overlapping, although maybe you folks will have some thoughts about whether that's confusing, um, duplicative, needlessly duplicative. Um, Jaime, if you could go back now to the Museum in the Streets uh, link. Uh, uh, there you go, thanks. Okay, so this link takes you to a brochure. It's the, uh, it's the text that appears on that uh, master map for lack of a better term, near the uh, open door offices. Could you scroll down, Jaime? There should be a third page, yeah. And this is exactly what the master map looks like, 25 sites as compared to the 25 on the walking tour. Uh, and here's the last bit I have to offer about this. Uh, it, it's not, um, certainly it's not obvious how you just add a site or two. Uh, we have uh, a master placard uh, that was printed at some expense. I don't know how much it cost, uh, but money needed to be raised for this program. Um, and if a site were to be added, whether it's the Brandreth site or any other site, it seemed to me that the master placard, master map would have to be completely redesigned and reprinted. Um, the other placards could remain standing. I suppose you'd have to um, just add uh, as many additional sites as, as, as need be. Uh, I visited the Museum in the Streets website. The Museum in the Streets, um, it is, from what I can tell, a for-profit entity. Uh, I can't say for sure. Um, it, it is not a state entity. It, it, it's 
Um, it's a program that was launched by someone with an interest in historic preservation and who works with a designer and some publicists and um, charges a fee for municipalities that are interested in creating their own museum in the streets. And presumably the museum in the streets placards are, you know, have a similar look from one village to another. There aren't so many villages that have actually done this, which is interesting. Uh, in Westchester, I believe Hastings has done this. Uh, and then elsewhere in the country, I believe there's a place in Maine, Massachusetts. It can't be more than 10 or so municipalities that have, have done this, uh, which is interesting. There is no place on the website that suggests next steps um, if uh, a municipality wants to add to or amend the, the placard. I think that would require follow-up phone calls and uh, it could be expected to, to cost some money. And I don't think it would make sense to do it for just one site for that reason. Administratively and financially, I don't think it would make sense to do it for one site. But of course, that's just my opinion. Let me know what you think. I, I think if we were going to expand the museum in the streets that we've got, uh, we should think of a few sites and, and do it all in one go. Why was the Brandreth Pill Factory omitted um, uh, from the original museum in the streets? I can't comment on that. Um, you know, the there are buildings and structures included on this uh, master plan that were not standing at the time that the Museum in the Streets was launched. So it's not um, at any rate obvious to me why the Brandreth Pill Factory was not included when this was launched. But be that as it may, it certainly is a significant site, it was a significant site uh, worthy of recognition. And there may be others worthy of recognition. So that's, uh, that's, that's all I've got to say about the museum in the streets. Um, does anyone have thoughts? I think I saw Dana, you raising your hand. Yes, I always have thoughts. Um, I believe the museum in the streets was an HPC initiative. I didn't realize that it was tied to, you said it was part of a bigger profit making organization. I'd have to, I'd have to, look into that a little bit more um, more in depth. I'm, I'm, I'm just not sure that. that's, that's the case, but what, it doesn't, I mean, I remember the HPC wrote it and did all the work. Um, but um, <clears throat> Joanne Tall, I think, spearheaded it. You know, Miguel Hernandez would know better. He was involved in it as well. And I think it, Miguel suggested adding the, the pill factory, which yeah, I don't know why it wasn't on there either. Maybe because it was kind of not in that downtown, you know, section. It was more, it's more down on the waterfront. Um, you know, I've been trying to argue to add um, some museum in the streets to Croton Avenue. You know, there are several historic spots worthy of it, including the Washington School, um, the Historical Society, uh, I could do up a list if you like. Um, but then you're just gonna have too much for one master map. So that maybe the thing is have a second master map on Croton, I don't know. But I don't know if in this time of budget, you know, tightening that um, it's, it's gonna be a high priority because I'm pretty sure the village paid for it out of their, Stuart, is that right, out of their budget? That's my understanding, Dana, yep. Yeah, so um, I'm not sure how much each sign cost, um, but uh, I know there's been an effort to link, you know, to, to make Croton Avenue and Main Street feel more of an extension of each other, right? One way to do that would be to extend the museum in the streets. Um, you know, I've done a lot of the research already I could write them up and you could have them translated, but, um, and there's, I have images and all that. So it's a matter of cost. I think that, you know, in terms of adding the pill factory, I know 
you know, someday, maybe there will be a little gazebo with, uh, you know, history and stuff, but Lord knows when that will be. So um, I don't know, you know, whether you want to redo, you know, the whole sign for the, for the pill factory. I'm trying to think you know, I mean, you could add maybe a, a few others that are down Spring Street if you want to expand the radius. You know what I mean? Then it starts getting a little unwieldy at some point. You know, I think it, you start diluting the impact when you kind of start spreading it out all over the place. Yeah, I would note that uh, at the moment, I believe that, that, that the pill factory site is actually off the map. Um, it's not even on the map. No. Just slightly. Like over here. Thank you, Jaime. That's a good observation. I have a suggestion for updating um, the map. That's kind of low budget, <laughs> uh, but there, if there's some place for us in the master map, if you're going to do an update, create a QR code to a new map that would bring up everything. So everyone's using a phone, and everyone loves QR codes, and all you do is put something on there with the QR code and the person will go up to the map and you would just notate that there's an update. They would um, put their phone up to the camera and it brings up the new map. I mean, it's very simple. I mean, it might just be a, a band-aid until more money makes itself available. Um, but a QR that's, code. That's if we add sites, right? So right, if we add, add sites. So and it's, um, it's fairly um, low cost. So if you did it over a period of time, you can keep changing it until the money was available to make a new map. Well, the other part of this is that there's signage at the locations. So people are still gonna see those signs. Um, I think Croton Avenue has one at the library that talks about the Carnegie Library. But I think that's the only one. Um, you know, the thing about putting the sign down at the pill factory, I mean, we all know that's kind of a controversial site right now. Um, I guess you would have to get permission to put it on someone else's property, right? So that's a, a whole other thing. You're dealing with private property. Whereas I think the current signage is on public property, right? They're all pretty much, it's on sidewalks outside the library. So it, that's a bit different, you know. Um, but it would certainly, you know, it'd be great. You just have to let people know it's there if you want people driving down there. I mean, people tend not to drive down there unless they're going to work at the, at the you know, light industry that's down there. Um, but uh, so there's just other issues with that. You know, it's not quite the same, I don't think. By the way, while, uh, while you were talking, Dana, I took the opportunity, I just went on to their site. It's called, if anyone wants to look, the museum in the streets.com. Got about 10 towns in the US, actually more than that, a whole bunch in Maine, four in New York, some in Connecticut, et cetera, and a lot of towns in France actually uh, on the uh, on this um, in this program and yes it is a for-profit um, site yeah you got it right there and uh, no costs uh, posted but uh, I, I assume you get a quote when you when you say what what you want done so did this group then help with the creation of the signs? Did they give a template for shape of sign? And is, is that consistent throughout? I didn't realize yeah. that there was a group. Yeah, and the signs apparently, and you know, now that I think of it, I think I saw this that might have been in Hastings or Hastings and yeah. as it Millbrook and then other sites, uh, Denbury, Ridgefield, Connecticut. I, I was in another town and did see these kind of signs and said, oh yeah, it's, it's the same kind of signage, same kind of, kind of format. Well, I wonder if we were to expand it, whether we would have to go back to these folks and give them more money for something. It's not quite clear to me 
how they make their, <laughs> did the village pay them for the rights to use the museum in the street's name? I think um, it's a payment and it's not totally clear from the website, but I think it's payment when you, when you have it done and they print up the signs, um, proofread the text, and do all the, the fancy formatting for the signs. So it would seem to me, and I don't know if there's an ongoing payment for this, I, I don't know if anybody knows, but, um, but it seems to me you pay a fee just to get Yeah, so I'm looking at the, I mean, there's a process here, it's outlined in the Museum in the Streets website under our process, and so, uh, okay. they, they, I mean, you have to do a lot of the legwork of organizing the imagery and the text and everything else. They, they put together the design of the signs and then once everything's yeah. signed out. Um, Paid in thirds, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Yeah. Like Folks, just so you know, uh, there was a resolution. This was back in 2015. At that point, uh, it was going to cost the village an amount not to exceed $19,000. Would we have to pay more to, yeah, if we make more signs, then we yeah. to make the signs. Okay, that's I think, what I Yeah, yeah I, I seem to read it that way. I think if you'd want more added, yeah, it, you'd get another it, sign. Yeah, there's a whereas clause that the design portion of the project has been substantially complete and based upon the increase in the number of markers to be ordered by the village and current pricing for materials a revised contract price is now required. So yes, you put up more signs, you're going to pay more money. And back in 2015, that was 19,000. So this is something we can explore, certainly. I, I just don't think it uh, necessarily makes sense to, uh, to explore this with respect to just one site. I think it, it might make sense to explore expanding the museum in the streets to a host of other sites. I mean, if you like, I can make a list of Croton Avenue going all the way up to Camp Woods. You know, I mean, there's about, I would say half a dozen on Croton Avenue um, that would bear mentioning, um, you know, Camp Woods, was the end of the trolley line and is a very historic site. They should do, they want to do, and they want to do something. Um, they want to be part of Museum in the Streets, they told me as much. So it would be a matter, I mean, it's not that hard. I mean, the images and the copy, that's the easy part. It's just a matter of getting, seeing if the village is going to want to allocate funds at this time. I can also, it's free for me to make a call to um, the museum in the streets itself and ask some preliminary questions. I think Joyce's idea about the QR codes is a really interesting one. Uh, maybe they've totally revised this, you know, this was, you know, back in the day before the QR codes were commonplace. Maybe the museum in the streets programs now are mostly QR codes. I don't know. Uh, so it'd be interesting to find out, uh, you know, you know, the costs, uh, how QR codes are being used, what other villages have done, if they'd like to add sites, I can make a phone call. And Dana, it may be interesting if, if you could forward to the group a list of additional sites. One other thought is that there is a free program, a grant program, which the Museum in the Streets is not. Uh, the, uh, the, the Pomeroy. Pomeroy program. Uh, which um, it is a program run through the state of New York. Um, they, you supply the text, they provide the sign at no cost. It's got to be a historically significant site. I'm not sure of all the parameters, but that may be uh, also worth exploring. And Dana, you're right to sort of flag the issue of, um, you know, uh, of property ownership and getting permission to plant a sign. And I, I don't know how that played out with the, with the first round of the museum in the streets, but it's something to be mindful of. The Pomeroy 
grant program is great, but it's much more limited in terms of how many words you can use. There's no images involved in most of them. They're very, I once, um, I tried to, to do, I took a class and one of the exercises was to write a Pomeroy sign. And I tried to do one for Camp Woods and it was, it's like trying to write a haiku. I mean, it was insane. It's like, how do you, you know, you have only so many letters per line and only so many lines and, you know, um, they're very, uh, they're free, but they're, they're pretty cursory. I, I, I find them very, you know, I would want to see more than a Pomeroy sign. There's a Pomeroy sign, I think, at Dale Cemetery, and there's a Pomeroy sign at Sparta for the Leatherman. Um, I think Miguel Hernandez was responsible for those. He knows that ins and outs of Pomeroy pretty well. Hi, Miguel, I know you're going to watch this. Um, but, um, but I think it's a good idea then to, to, to explore it. I do think. I've been wanting to expand it up Croton Avenue to Camp Woods. Because I think that would be, it'd be good for Croton Avenue. It'd be good for our goal of trying to connect the downtown to Croton Avenue. Um, and there are some very historic sites on Croton Avenue. In fact, the site of the, of the toll road where you had to pay your money in, you know, 1800 to bring your goods down the turnpike all the way down to the waterfront is on Croton Avenue. Um, so you can have a lot of fun with it. Um, so if you want, I'll, I'll do up a list and then you can call in them and just see, you know, maybe we can start trying to get a ballpark of what it would cost to add signs. You know? Okay. Very good. Does anyone have anything else they wish to add about the museum and the streets? I did have one follow-up question about uh, the the downtown walking tour. Uh, it, the, uh, I'm getting so. Oh, uh, the only thing. Um, did anyone have any thoughts about the uh, downtown walking tour and any confusion that may be caused by these overlapping tours with different sites? I don't think people know about the downtown walking tour. It is uh, older. It's funny. I was going through some stuff in the town and I came across some of the uh, paper guides to it, the brochure handout. Um, but it's, it's, it's quite a bit older and I believe may have been done. I don't know if it's a lot older. It may have been done in conjunction with the bicentennial, or I think there might've been a connection there, but do we need both? Yeah. You know. I guess the systematic thing to do would be a comparison of the two, uh, see what's labeled on both, and then where where we where we would want to take it in terms of what do we want to update, perhaps looking at the narratives in both and comparing that. I mean, so just off of like a first pass, it, it appears that maybe, and maybe I'm looking at this incorrectly, but it appears that all the items that are listed on the walking tour are actually there. And the museum tour includes several places that are not physically there anymore. So I think that's a big oh, difference. Which, which one? They're not physically there anymore? Well, like the Carnegie Library. Just as an example. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are several of those. There's lo oh, downtown is full of places that aren't there anymore. No, what I mean is the Village of Osney downtown walking tour, like all of those things that are listed are still there. Oh, right, yeah. So they're still there. So you could walk there and see them. Whereas the museum, you could see a marker, but not necessarily all of the items that are listed there are actually right. there anymore. They're just markers of something that used to be there. Um, no, so most, of them are there. most of them are still there. Some of them are not. My initial response to this is let's take down the Village of Hassening downtown walking tour. We've got the museum in the streets, which is hard enough for people to find online. Um, and maybe make the museum in the streets easier to find, uh, more accessible, 
maybe add some more to what's available online. And the nice thing about um, this downtown walking tour uh, is this brochure that Jaime is scrolling through because we, we don't have a brochure for the museum in the streets that includes, um, you know, the, these descriptions all in one place. Uh, I'm not aware of any place online that collects a site-by-site -site description in, in the nice way that it's done here. But I, I personally think it's confusing. And uh, I don't know, do people even know this? I don't know if people explore the, you only know about the downtown walking tour if you stumble across it on the website, on the yeah. village website. And you know, um, Museum in the Streets is quite obvious. This is all online. This is just lives online. Yeah. So, you know. Well, maybe we, be, you know, there is a section on the village website that says walking downtown Ossining. Uh, maybe that needs to be revisited. I don't know. But I'll think some more about it. I invite everyone else to think some more about it. Um, and in the meantime, I'll email uh, Jaime and, and Jamie about the suggested changes to the website and I'll see I'll CC everyone. All right, uh, moving on to a few miscellaneous matters that were not on the agenda. Um, first, um, it came to my attention that there was some exterior uh, work being done outside of 125 Main Street, that uh, the location of DOCA's it uh, looks like there is a, a, a plywood enclosure um, in, the, in the front of that building, as well as some uh, barriers. It looked like the Department of Public Works had put up the barriers. Now I'm not so sure. I asked Stuart to look into the matter. Stuart, if, if you don't mind being put on the spot, could you update the group on that? Adam, as I wrote to you today, the HPC in 2016 approved a certificate of appropriateness for a third floor addition and for exterior work to the storefront. The work has been stopped because they did not get a permit to uh, obstruct the sidewalk as required by the village code. Okay, well, will uh, the owner need to come before the HPC? Uh, oh, he got, an, he got a COA in 2016. Okay, so the only thing that's expired is the building permit. That's correct. So he needs to reapply for that. Correct. Okay. Well, we, uh, Stuart did circulate the COA to me. I will circulate it to the group. And, um, you know, COAs are meaningless unless there's compliance, which has been an issue with some property owners on Main Street. Uh, so I, I invite everyone to uh, review the COA and um, and bear that in mind as as progress on on 125 Main Street continues. I'll pay a visit to Melita. Melita Silva. It's her building. I'll find out what's going on. Okay. I'd also uh, turning to another subject. I'd also note that we're in October. We've got just three months left before the end of 2020. Uh, we're required as members of a land use commission to complete four hours of training. Um, I, you know, there are fewer training opportunities now uh, that everything is being done virtually. Uh, there are some good trainings available through the New York State Department of State. Uh, I've done two trainings so far, a total of two or two and a half credit hours, one on historic preservation. Uh, again, this is on the New York State Department of, of State website on local government trainings. The uh, training I did on historic preservation I thought was, was really excellent. So I highly recommend that. There's also a training on conducting meetings that's less interesting, but worthwhile. Uh, and I will let the group know of any other trainings uh, I find online that may be of interest. And if, if any of you find out about any trainings online, please share with the group. 
Are you going to uh, send that out to the group, Adam? Sure, I'll send a link uh, to the Department of State, uh, the, the, the section of the Department of State website that's got these online trainings. And again, that, that, the historic preservation training is really excellent. So I okay. highly recommend it. That sounds interesting. Um, I don't mean to cut you off. If we could back up to um, the, your prior topic on renovations to buildings, and I don't know if this falls within our purvey or not, but that restaurant Dokush uh, in town has got plywood in the front and they're taking out, seems to be taking out their doors in the front. That's the building we were just talking about, Stephen. Oh, that is, I'm sorry. Okay, you mentioned the number and I didn't know that that That's was. it. Okay, great, okay. Uh, I'm in the middle of a book. I'll recommend it when I'm done, but I'm loving it so far. Uh, called The Death and Life of Great American Cities by Jane Jacobs. And there's a, a phrase she uses over and over again about eyes on the streets. So yeah, I think it's useful that we have people who are familiar with this certificate of, uh, uh, of appropriateness that was issued in 2016 and that there are eyes on the streets to ensure compliance. Um, I don't think that's what she meant by eyes on the streets. No, no, no. The reuse. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'll leave, I'll leave it there. Um, that's all that I had for for tonight. Um, does anyone else have any other topics they'd wish to bring up? I, I have a question about an item from the the last meeting uh, where um, the in the minutes uh, the discussion regarding the windows in the Methodist Church and the the issues that are going on there and then some um, you know follow up uh, an attempt to or an idea to send out letters to historic sites and um, I just wonder, you know, what else can we do before, you know, the wrecking ball hits the building or the windows are... Um, yeah, that, because that's... it's fine, but at that point, it's, it's too late. I, if there is anything, I, I don't know. If we need to talk about that further or see where, where we need to go with that. Thank you, Stephen, for bringing that up. Uh, it feels like the last meeting was less than a full month ago. Uh, yeah, certainly, I've been extremely busy these last few weeks, and I haven't had an opportunity to um, uh, to think some more about how to approach the uh, the issue with the United Methodist Church. Uh, but I, I do think a letter would be appropriate, um, so that they are aware that they are a locally landmarked property. That before they undertake changes to the exterior of that structure. They need to come before the HPC. Um, and I, I think a letter to that effect would be useful. And more generally, I think uh, it may be worth thinking about, this is food for thought for the future, um, you know, making sure that property owners in landmark districts know that they're in a landmark district and they need to come before the HPC if they want to make changes to the exterior of, the, of their buildings. So I'll be thinking some more about that. I invite you all to think some more about that as well. Anything else? Do we have two more meetings left this year? I think that's right, Dana. Because I, I think I have to leave the board on Jan 1 assuming I get elected. So I guess we are one person down now, correct? Right. So we'll be two people down. So I, we should start thinking about it now, maybe. If anyone knows any good candidates, I don't know how we usually, or weren't there, aren't there a couple of alternates? Aren't there a I, couple of alternates? I had heard that alternates there's a rumor about alternates being appointed, but I, I don't know if that went anywhere. Stuart, did that go anywhere? I seem to have lost Stuart. Oh. Okay, well, just a thought. I received an email for someone that was interested, um, Adam. I sent it to Karen. I can forward you the email I received as well. That's great. Thank you, Joyce. And I, mean, I think getting a diversity on this board is just as important as any other board. And, um, you know, I would, you know, I'd love to see us, um, um, you know, add a, some diverse, more diversity, so. 
Jefferson. We're here virtually, of course. There was also a rumor about doing in per or returning to in-person meetings. Jaime, is there any update with respect to that? Uh, it was just extended to November 3rd. So, um, you know, not this month, not next month probably. I think that, you know, what we can assume is that as long as the numbers are going up, that we're not gonna, you know, change anything. I, if, if I had to guess, and that's all I can do at this point, is that um, it won't be until the spring, um, just because the winter is like a critical season, and I don't see why they would start recommending, you know, at the height of the flu season that people start, you know, crowding into public space and stuff. My guess is that we're not gonna do that. The, the village board has um, gone to these hybrid meetings. Um, I, I, you know, the planning board, the zoning board uh, have mixed opinions about whether or not to move to hybrid meeting. Um, you know, I, it's, it's, I think it is the call of the board to decide whether you really wanna meet in person. Um, I'm not sure that there's a ton of extra value the, the, if you have attended any of these in-person meetings, and I did uh, attend one, uh, not last week, but the week before, uh, they're very unwieldy. Um, everybody is like very far apart. And if you're an applicant and you're trying to come and talk about your case, you can't get close to anybody to show anybody anything. You still have to do everything virtual. Uh, if you're not at your home computer, you'll be just talking into a computer on the street. It's just not really a, a good setup um, until, until people can, you know, theoretically approach the, you know, the group and show what they're trying to show. Uh, and the, you know, the, the place where these meetings would normally be held is at the operation center. And that is not a room that's really well set up to have that many people in it. Um, you know, it's very tight, as you know. Uh, so it would just be tough. And I think that there are, you know, certainly some people that are comfortable meeting um, in person, but I, I think that there are also quite a few people that are not, and so. Is there anyone on the commission here today that feels strongly about conducting meetings uh, in person or in a hybrid fashion? Adam, this is Phil, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I am uh, very much in the remote camp until we have this whole thing straightened out the pandemic numbers go down and so forth. I, uh, that's, you know, where my thoughts are. Mine too. But yeah, I don't think we need to rush. I don't think we need to rush into any sort of in-person, especially, you know, until we get more, you know, without more um, applications and stuff. Um, I, 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 I agree. I agree. I'd be in favor of keeping it this way for now. Yeah, again, you know, the Board of Trustees are doing it only because they are having public hearings on public laws, and, and so there is a, a value to that, but they have to use the gym, which means the gym gets shut down for a night, right? So the public loses access to that gym uh, as well. So it's just, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough situation. I, um, having sat through one of them, they are, they're challenging, I think, for anybody who wants to take part in them. That's why the Board of Trustees does not do their work sessions in person. They do those over Zoom. Okay, well, if anyone asks, Jaime, I think um, this commission has made its position clear. We are uh, very happy to keep these meetings remote until uh, this plague is eradicated or, or until it's reasonably safe to do so. Uh, I mean, on a sort of separate note to that, I, I, I wonder, is it, because I've only done these remote with this group, um, is, is the experience better or worse virtually? I found for the planning board, it feels like it's better. Well, it depends on who's there to yell at you about something, but uh, <laughs> um, I think it's better for kind of, I don't know, I think it's great, but if you really are doing something that requires public comment and stuff, you know, I find in person, is better, but I don't know if people are going to be willing to come and make a public comment. Um, but uh, we're not doing anything terribly, we're not threatening to landmark anybody, so I don't think we 
<laughs> you know, worry about controversy right now. But, um, you know, I, you know, that's the only thing I would say. I think this works. I mean, I miss having my little nameplate in front of me, you know, and the microphone that doesn't work. Well, you do but, all have your name in front of you. That's, that's, <laughs> but your um, this works fine for now, I think, you know. Okay. With that, uh, unless anyone has anything else they wish to raise, um, uh, I would like to make a motion to adjourn tonight's meeting. Second. second it? Dana White seconded the motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. That's all right. that, folks. Thank you Good all night. so much. I, I hope everyone stays safe. Um, there, there is an uptick, and, and please stay safe. You too. Thank you. Thank Good you. night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.